Okay, so our uh, speaker for this uh, for this uh, session now is uh, Stephen Hume. Uh, so Stephen Hume is a software engineer at the Southern African Large Telescope, aka SALT in Sutherland, where he enjoys making web-based tools to ease the lives of both astronomers and engineers. In addition to designing software and control systems for the telescope and its instruments, he gets a kick out of analyzing and visualizing data. A uh, mechatronic engineer by training, uh, Stephen has a passion for creating interactive technologies at the intersection of disciplines and was once awarded a certificate for being the most likely to become a weather reporter. Very interesting. Okay, so um, without further ado, uh, please welcome uh, Stephen. Hello, thank you very much for that um, introduction. Uh, I didn't realize I'd have the full bio read out, but um, so now that's out the way. Um, welcome. Let's see if I can even share my webcam. See how that goes. I might, I might off at some point. Um, there we are. Hi. Welcome. So um, this is a what started out as a fun project on the side, just one weekend. Um, realized I had access to some telescope data and the webcams and kind of wondered, well, they go outside and you see the beautiful sky up in Sutherland and um, something similar to the backdrop on the side here. So we wonder, what's that bright thing? Is that a star? Is it a planet? Um, yeah, so wondered if I could put the information together and um, spoke to a couple of astronomers and engineers, and turned out this was actually a, a long requested feature at the telescope. So without further ado, I'll show you how it all came together. And to answer your question, Casey, it is in fact a plane, if you're referring to the streak of lights on the right. Um, the telltale signs there are the alternating red and green dots. Next challenge. Once, ah, next slide. Brilliant. So this is the telescope, um, SALT. It's up in Sutherland in Northern Cape, about four hours drive from Cape Town. Um, that's what it looks like inside from the top. It's got 91 hexagonal mirrors, each about a meter in diameter. So altogether, it's a 10 meter primary mirror. It's used to look at stars and galaxies predominantly, but we look at nebula and whatever else is up in the night sky. Um, what is important to note is that it is a Q-based telescope. Um, so it has limited movement. Um, it's a alt as mount. So it goes up and down and left and right. So it can go 540 degrees left and right. So that's about a rotation and a half um, approximation. Um, but up and down, it can only move about um, 10, 15 degrees from 47 degrees above the, vertic above the horizon to 59 degrees above the horizon. So because of that, there's a limited part of the sky can view at any one time. That means we run it Q scheduled. So we will look at a certain science block for anywhere from five minutes to maybe a bit over an hour before going on to the next target. So this is the plateau in Sutherland. There's, I think, 27, might be 30 telescopes up there these days. And you can see all the domes in the image there. Uh, let's see if I can even point to it. There we are. There's a laser pointer. So SALT is the big one at the back. Um, it's a bit deceptive in terms of scales. That's a 10 meter mirror. This one on the left here is a one meter mirror. Um, it's just that salt is further back. Um, what I would like to point out is this little round box over here, colloquially known as the ox wagon. Um, and that is where the all sky camera is located. Um, and that is what has been taken images of the sky that we're going to look at just now. So this is zoomed in on the ox wagon. You can, you can see where it gets its name from. And this little camera, 
that's firmly duct taped onto the computer case is all sky cam. It's a protected things and has a 360 view degree of the sky. Um, there's some software running on this computer here that takes a picture every 15 to 60 seconds. So the exposure length depends on the amount of available light and makes it available for our weather web page to pick it up. I'll go into the more detail. Yeah. So in Sutherland, um, there are resident astronomers and there are guest astronomers. So we have the weather information available for everyone to see. It's a publicly accessible web page. I'll give you the address just now. And one of the things we have on here, besides temperature, humidity, um, approximate cloud cover, is of course the webcams. So there are two of them on the plateau. The one on the left here is the Oscar cam that I will be talking about in a bit more detail. The one on the right is from a different organization, um, external. Uh, we host their telescopes. As part of that, they've included their all sky cam too. So you've got a, a backup should one of them fail. How does the user view the image? Well, we've seen going from the camera to the web page. What we're going to do is add an enabling script here to add annotations to the sky image showing where the telescope is pointing and what the stars and planets are. And um, what's also important to note is how the image is transferred. So the original image is taken and is sits on a web server that's available. And the labeling script is going to grab that from HTTP connection and um, before leaving it on its own web server. And finally, the web page will query the labeling script web server for the final image. So what are the requirements for this project? Overall, we want to increase the situational awareness of the environment. Um, this has become particularly important with remote operations due to COVID. And before you could just put your head outside of the dome, look outside of the sky, it might be a little cold, potentially wet, but you could do it. With remote operations from Cape Town or even further field, that's not possible. So these all sky cameras are the only view we have of the night sky. Um, one of the other main things we need to do is avoid approaching cloudy weather. You often get light cloud rolling in from the south or from the west. Um, and you want to get an idea of how fast it's coming and if it might interfere with your observation that's in progress. So you want to get an idea of that, the direction that the clouds come from is important. You want to see where the telescope is currently pointing to on the sky. So just looking at you won't see the actual star or the target in the image, but you'll get the general direction. Um, you see that enabled image just now. And finally, labeling the stars and planets. So what are our constraints? You need to do actual labeling within 15 seconds. That's the shortest exposure at nighttime in general, and that's not a difficult constraint to meet. Um, points require an accuracy of half a degree, so that's the diameter of the full moon. In the image here, you can see a full moon, um, but it's a little misleading. This is a 60 second exposure, I think, so there's a lot of bloom effect. In actuality, the moon is the size of the bright star on the left. Let's see, there we are. Size of that bright star, or a pointer. Pointer is actually a much better representation. And finally, oh, it's used mainly by astronomers for analysis, but is publicly accessible. And there's the web page I was telling you about. Um, so if you go to that now, you'll actually see live weather in Sutherland. And you won't see the night sky, it's daytime, and the enclosure over the camera is closed. So you just see the inside. If you go back after dark and it isn't cloudy, you should get a view of the night sky in Sutherland. And of course, probably the biggest constraint of all time. Um, this wasn't a high priority project, it was a very much nice to have. Um, so there wasn't time available for development or maintenance. So put, to, put it together quickly and not need to make lots of changes to it once it's up. If you need to make changes, make it easy. So how are we going to do this? 
First, we need to keep the existing met metadata. We already had the image displayed on the web page. It had the date, it was taken, and the time, and the exposure link, and that was it. Um, the next thing we need to do is add compass tables. North is at the top and south is at the bottom, but east and west are swapped. So west is actually to the right here, and east is to the left there. Then we're going to label all the points, as I've already mentioned. And finally, we need to show where the telescope is pointing to. So we're going to put a little point um, somewhere around here. And if it's looking at this bright star, say, you'll see salt labeled there. Um, because I said it was restricted to where it could, which part of the skies it could look at, um, between 47 and 59 degrees, there is what's known as a visibility annulus, a donut of the sky that it can view at a single point in time. So it's around here, you see it labeled later on. Uh, we can't look down at the horizon and we can't look straight up to the center of the sky. So some fundamental concepts about astronomy um, that we need to run through quickly before we go much further. First, the equatorial coordinate system. Um, this is how we map the stars on the sky. It works very similarly to latitude and longitude on Earth where right ascension is longitude and declination is latitude. The only real difference in terms of right ascension is the meridian is all the way at the right of the map, as it were. So we have the prime meridian going through Greenwich and London. Um, in the equatorial coordinate system, it's all, our, all the way at the right, as you can see on the diagram there. And finally, the horizontal axis is reversed. Um, so zero is on the right and 24 hours or 360 degrees is on the left. The diagram there shows the night sky as seen from Salt and Sutherland. Um, so because we're in the Southern Hemisphere, we can only see stars in the Southern Hemisphere and about 11 degrees across the equator. We can't see the Northern Hemisphere stars like the Big Dipper or Polaris. What's particularly nice here is you can see the Milky Way this big bright bit here, and the large and small magnogenic clouds. The Southern Cross is over there somewhere, and Orion is around there somewhere. Horizontal well, coordinate system. So this is how the telescope works, and what it uses to point at the sky. And this is azimuth, left and right, and altitude, up and down. So. Um, for azimuth, the zero is north, 360 degrees is north again, and 80 degrees is south, 90 is east, and 270 is west. Altitude is degrees above the horizon, so the horizon is at zero degrees, and you can go all the way up to 90 over here. As I mentioned before, the telescope is constrained, so that's about 47 to 59. That's where the telescope is pointing and then just swivels right around. And motion of the stars. So you bring the celestial coordinate system and the horizontal coordinate system together, you get apparent motion. This is the track that the stars make over the course of the evening as the Earth spins on its axis. So within 24 hours, or just this, so I do all day, and they do a full rotation. And the image shown here, this is about two and a half hours. Um, and you can see the tracks that they make. The center here, um, you see there's almost no rotation, that is the South Celestial Pole. And so that's the part of the sky that hardly rotates at all. Um, in this image, you can't see the equator, but the stars on the equator, they don't go around, they just go up and down. It's an interesting thing about being on a sphere. Okay, fits files. Going well into astronomy territory here. Um, this is a file format that was originally designed in 1981 for storage. It's compatible. So if you have anything around the ASO, they map it just as well as it was written. And it's particularly for multi dimensional data and 2D images, 3D image cubes, 4D data. 
and the list goes on. And then there's also metadata files too, in the form of Q. I see there are some um, Hi. Uh, hello. Uh, sorry, 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 uh, sorry. Uh, no, no, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Hi, can you hear me? I just want to check. Uh, can anyone else? Does anyone else hear me clearly? Yeah. Yes. No. Uh, checking. Okay. So, um, Stefan, I think uh, it seems to be a consistent thing right now. Can you just maybe quickly, um, like, uh, uh, stop and then rejoin, or not, not rejoin, but like start and stop your stream again, or something along those along along that along those lines? Sure, that's no problem. I'll, I'll turn my webcam off as Yeah, it's yeah. safe to just to reconnect, I guess. Okay, then, um, join you back in a moment. Okay. Sorry, guys. Uh, he's doing it right now. Yes, I, I, or, or, or maybe it's a reference to a joke, which I totally get. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let me let me uh, let me know if anyone sees him in the chat uh, in the list of people on the left before I do. I'm looking for him constantly. Ah, there we go. There he is. Oh, um, Stephen, you might need to uh, me join as a with a microphone, like a speaker. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Well, I made him presenter, uh, so if you do manage to uh, have your microphone working in this mode you're in now, then that's great, but maybe not. Yeah, I, I'm, I've unblocked him and made him a presenter. But uh, I think, yeah, I see his name next to uh, Yeah, Stephen, I see on your side you have a, only a headphone symbol, which means I think you joined without a microphone on. I did actually watch the entire IT crowd twice, so I should have gotten that right away. I mean, I, I reference ever well, so anyway. Okay, where is he? Looking in. Oh, great. Yeah, that's one nice thing about U UK TV shows. They're uh, like relatively short, especially with the number of episodes. It's actually very rewatchable. Uh, okay. Again, let me see Stephen before I do. Let me know. Just comes to looking. Ah, uh, there we go, Stephen Hume.
Okay, I made Stephen, uh, you a presenter and unlocked you. I'll do see the headphones again. Hopefully that's not an issue. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Hello. I Hello. think we're finally back. Well, if we do get to issues again, then I think we might as well just push through it. Yeah, cool. Okay, thanks. thanks. Sure. Sorry about that interruption. Um, I'll recap that last slide quickly in case yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, currently don't see anything. Oh, there we go. Thanks. And let's see if we can go. Um, sorry, sorry, Stephen. Uh, well, I think we're getting the issue again. Can you uh, sh uh, stop screen sharing and instead use the PDFs? Uh, upload those and just slide the slideshow in those because I think you might have bandwidth issues on your side. Please. All right. Um, I'm trying to remember. I lost a look at it like a month or two ago. Um, uh, probably in the bottom. Well, first of all, disable your screen sharing uh, right now so that we can just hear you. So I, I can't hear your feedback right now. There you go. Sure. Sorry. Okay. Um, I don't. Yeah, I'm trying to remember ah, now exactly. Found it. Found it. Found it. Excellent. I upload it now. Sorry about this. Yeah. Okay, not hearing you at all in case you're saying something. Um, not seeing the slide yet. Oh, uh, I was just asking the questions. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Any questions, anyone? Yeah, so I think um, uh, we'll let you know if this goes choppy, so just uh, if you can keep uh, an eye out. So I, don't, I don't have to interrupt you, and then you can just probably repeat what you said, just be safe. It will be without sharing. I can promise you that. Okay, brilliant. Uh, let's see. Okay. So, this needs to be. Um, unpacked. I stress can hear me as a presentation. You can go from degrees around a circle to hours, minutes, and seconds. It's a string. Uh, 
uh, radiance, and then very simple to use. Coordinate manipulation, coordinate frame, so to convert from the, to the horizontal coordinate system, that's all taken care of. And finally, it reads and writes fits files. Just so. And we know where the camera and precisely using GPS coordinates. And we need to take exposure length into your control to the celestial objects or the stars and planets, what coordinates we expect them to be. And finally, to get, to get the final result as you see on the right. Uh, the result is also the so, let's start looking at some code. Um, taking out I think I just think, um, but I've added everything. Yeah. Uh, so I've added it, put a message in there, and but I've tried as required. Stars and planets, a uh, quick um, What you'll notice is there are no R, A, and DEC, uh, right ascension declination coordinates listed there. That is because AstroPi can look up those coordinates um, given the name. It just doesn't know the brightness of the stars. Finally, we read in a list of so this is planets are there except for Mercury. Just the sun to them, and of course Earth, which hopefully we shouldn't need a great display to. Of course, AstroPi and this wonderful a ASCII tab separated value file. A note to future presenters: transitioning between is a slow process. Apologies for the interruption. So to calculate the star positions, I hope you can, can read that there. Um, if you zoom in, yes, you can zoom in and see it a lot easier. Um, you, that is far big. What we want to do is find where the stars are located on the sky, if they are visible, and then plot them. So there's a quick check to see if the star is in fact visible. Um, in the northern hemisphere, so so minus thirty odd degrees in Sutherland, two degrees. Um, I think it's actually going to be plus 30 degrees in the northern hemisphere, which means you don't see the stars, we can disregard them. And we check if it's nighttime in Sutherland. If it is nighttime, we show the stars. If it isn't, we don't. And instead, we show the sun, the moon, and Venus, which you can actually see during the daytime if you know where to look. It's quite helpful to have a tree above you so you have some reference frame. So when you're scanning the sky and know where to look, you know you can kind of check that area. Finally, um, we use the built-in solar system framework to get all the coordinates and then they are as positions on the sky and so that's the 
that is the list of points we're going to label. This is in fact the same slide. This works far better in PowerPoint. Um, we can compare the previous image of the sky to the calculated positions um, of the stars. This is just a sanity check um, to make sure the stars and um, the most helpful thing is you can see where it's about a point where it um, isn't much rotation, and um, so that's where it is there. And you can see all the stars. Okay, so let's do some actual plotting. We've written the um, image and metadata with AstroPy. That essentially x and y and a brightness value for each coordinate. And you can plot that very simply and the in show function. Quick question. Adam, how am I meant to respond to good, medium, and bad? Um, I it's just I have no idea actually. It's just feedback, just to let you know if if uh, it's giving an idea of whether or not you actually be good or not. How much of uh, like how much of it? So I think I think you you probably want to. Know. I I can stop doing it if you want. It is slightly distracting if I'm on. Okay, we'll just leave it. And carry on. Okay. Binary, grayscale color map, uh, min and v max. I think it's one percent of the brightest pixels and thirty-three percent. So that removes your dead pixels and your bright pixels, and finally we make it fit the whole figure frame. Now I need to plot the star positions on top of that. So there is a module in AstroPy called AstroPlan. It does all observational planning and shows where stars are on the sky. Out the box, it generates these plots, I like can see here, and this is straight from the tutorial on the website. And um, the code I have actually implemented is slightly more complex, just because of all the loops and formatting that is involved. So you can see a simplified version on the right. There's some things I do want to point out is the salt variable. And there is a database of telescopes already in AstroPy. So if you just give it the name of the telescope you're observing on, salt, you get the coordinates out of that. Uh, you can also add in your own GPS coordinates if you like. Get observation time. We read that from the metadata in the FITS file. And then you plot it and just overlaid on the same axes, which you can extract using that plot further. So this is my version of that same function. Um, there's formatting at the top, and this is where we plot the circles with a um, shadow underneath things. So Jupiter you can see is hard to see in this image. Um, the white circle and the yellow don't contrast very well. So in later images, I added a shadow and finally the label of the image itself. Now, of course, there's camera distortion. Nothing is perfect, theory and practice. So I have the image, I have the stars. I need to make sure they align and 
there are some there are a couple of basic parameters that are easy to correct for with all star cams. So the width and the height are fixed. That's your image size, so 620 by 480 unbend pixels. Um, the center of the image, I initially made a guess um, and then adjusted that using the ever faithful iterative method until I found a number that worked. And then of course there's the scaling. So you notice that it's 95% of the original image on the horizontal axis and 99 the vertical axis. That is most likely because the camera pixels are not in fact square as they come off the detector. And finally, there was half a degree of rotation that was necessary. So here you can see the unscaled original image. The star Octus is outside its circle on the left there, but Rigel is outside on the right. So left, right, that is scaling on the width. Let's reduce that number back down to 95%. Now I need the telescope position. So we have a large database of all the telescope information. We have with um, anything older than that is deemed not current, uh, probably due to a technical fault. And then we plot it with the label. Um, our images are all calibrated already from the stars on the sky. So check if it's going to We made those the whole space. In that plot would help you be quite specific about how you handle plots um, and then save it. And finally, of course, close. Um, as I mentioned later, this runs the whole time. Um, it updates approximately every minute. So if you don't close your images very quickly, you run out of memory. Don't ask me how I know that. So deployment. Um, this is hosted on a virtual machine. Uh, which does not have access to the internet for security reasons. Um, it's really nice that in the packages and things, uh, I know some people will find the locking process a bit tedious and run into any serious issues with that. I found it very really time, updating every minute. It's been going for since May, four or five months now, um, with very few problems. Which I'm pleased to say that the problems I did have are going to uh, get more detail just now. Um, but just please hold on to our end. It's a, it's a good question. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, 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 are you finished? Sorry. What was there? No, I'm, I'm oh, sorry, sorry. about to go into pitfalls. I was just waiting for the slide to load. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. There's a huge lag in slide transitions on my side. I know you're getting trouble towards the end of this. No, no, no worries. Okay. 
of things I've discovered is just because it looks better doesn't mean it is better. Um, the bright and um, purple and green and yellow images I think look quite nice. It's easy to see the bright parts of the sky from the dim parts. Um, it's not Cold setting the Verdis color palette. Um, I was keen to keep it. Engineers like bright colors and clear information, but astronomers are used to interpreting images in the way they have always seen them. Um, there's lots of subtleties with cloud cover that you can pick up on all sky cams. Um, if the color suddenly changes from a sort of white to a light gray to a darker gray, shades of green can be hard for them to um, use their previous knowledge with the current images and yes james the label mark salt is in fact where the telescope is pointing at the time so that is the direction on sky in which it is looking at um, sometimes you'll see that is over say sirius or um, maybe the large hydrogenic cloud so we know that the telescope is looking at a star inside that area. The next pit for I came across was Earth's rotation. A day is not in fact 24 hours long. Um, it can vary by as much as three milliseconds from day to day. And that number changes over the course of years. So in the past, I think it's 50 years of that graph. Um, days are now um 25 not 25 seconds longer in total but 25 seconds more delayed since they started introducing leap seconds what this means for the script is you need to keep your rotation data up to date astropy by default and downloads the data from international earth rotation service and if that data expires a exception is raised Uh, sorry to interrupt if you are speaking and you can hear me. Uh, no audio at all now. Uh, uh, it's, I think um, we'll let you know when we can hear you and you can please restart from this, the, this when you move to the slide. Uh, no. Okay, let me see if I can. Thanks, Neil. Hello. Is that better? Hello. Yeah. Ah, brilliant. Can you stop hearing you when you just, uh, just started on the slide? Okay, thanks. That's that's really useful to know. Okay. Um, Earth, the rotation of the Earth varies from day to day, from month to month, and year to year. The number of tectonic, and oceanograph and ocean based ocean cores tidal changes that affect the rotation. Um, data is required to keep AstroPi up to date, and it will raise an exception if that data is older than 28 or 30 days old. Um, so I had to mute, not mute, uh, but turn off 
the raise of that exception to keep the script running for longer than 28 days with no internet connection. Fortunately, um, that change doesn't happen very quickly, so it should be fine for the next 15 years. There are likely to be other far more significant changes um, which I'll set up before that happens. Okay, the final issue I ran into was when temporary files were not temporary files. As I mentioned earlier, this was hosted on a virtual machine and pretty regularly once a month for the first couple of months, I got a call from IT saying your virtual machine hard drive is filling up. Make space for us, please. Um, so did a little digging. Uh, the cause was FITS files and they've been downloaded by AstroPy. Um, earlier, I mentioned that the all sky cam that was duct taped to the computer um, saves those files and they're accessed via HTTP on a web server. So AstroPy will download the FITS files, but it doesn't know when you finished using it. So it's up to the user, in this case me, to clear them manually. So as you can see, it was quite a quick change on the right. Um, so that is the diff I'm showing you, with the red line being the line I removed, and the green lines, the lines I added in its place. Um, so the script now clears the downloaded file manually once it has been removed, once it has been used. Okay, quick summary of Python packages. AstroPlan, um, as part of AstroPy, um, is used for determining which stars are visible at any point in time in the sky. Um, AstroPy is, of course, the base package that handles all the transformations and coordinate frames. The plotting is all done in Matplotlib. Um, and of course, Matplotlib, AstroPy based on NumPy. Pillow was required to produce PNGs. And Matplotlib cannot do that by default. And finally, SaltSilla is our internal package to access our telescope pointing data. Okay, that brings us very near to the end of our presentation. A couple of things to share with you though. When you are doing a project like this, you go through a lot of pictures of the sky. And so I thought I would highlight some of the more interesting ones. It's not something you get to see every day. So on the left, I'm gonna try Point, yes, I can use the laser pointer here. Uh, this is quite a nice picture of the night sky. You can see the moon just starting to rise on the right, Milky Way in the middle. This little spiral is known as the Southern Crown, um, the constellation. The bright star is Sirius. And this dotted line on the side is an airplane. I'm about 90% sure, the other 5% is a tumbling satellite, um, but most like an airplane um, with its red light flashing on and off. That's the air traffic, but in Sutherland, there's also a tiny bit of road traffic. So there's a single road on the plateau uh, where all the telescopes are, and the astronomers drive up and down between the hostel at the base of the plateau to the telescopes where they work at night. And because car lights are bright, we have a rule that you aren't allowed your headlights on when driving on the plateau. So instead, you put your emergency indicators on and drive slowly. So over the course of 15 seconds, this is a single car driving on the road with its indicator lights on. You can see the flashing quite nicely there. So one of the other telescopes on the plateau is called Monet. It is this um, bread basket or picnic basket style telescope over here. And here's a nice picture of it closing as the humidity was increasing one night. On the right, you can see what it looks like when it's closed. And the slightly darker bit is the actual telescope. I think that's about a half meter telescope that's housed inside that building. And then it's one of the more unusual ones. Um, a rocket launch. This was flagged one night in the night logs. Um, I haven't been able to pin down exactly which rocket there is. 
Uh, there were a couple of Chinese rockets launched in January 2018. Uh, it might have been the South African one. I don't know if we still do any small-scale rocket tests. I have no idea. But this bright um, burn, rocket burn, I suppose, in the southeast of the image here. Um, to our best guess, is actually a rocket launch. We saw it in two frames. The first frame was very small, something like that. The second frame um, for 60 seconds was quite bright, and then it vanished again. And finally, satellites and meteorites. Originally, this was in the PowerPoint, which showed GIFs quite nicely. So you could actually see a slight rotation of the image. And let's see, there is a slight, I want to say blur over there. That's just, just the first part of the satellite coming over. Um, if you imagine this line longer, that's the effect in the next image. And what you can also see though, is a meteorite. That's the little bright bit over there. And there is a second one, I think it's that little bright bit over there. This bright glow on the right is a local phenomenon. It's the moon reflecting off the guide uh, wires holding up this weather mast. And then, of course, that is the large and small metangenic cloud. So that um, brings my presentation to an end. Thank you very much for listening and apologies for the sound issues. Um, Adam, I, have you been keeping track of the questions I haven't got? You know, uh, yes, I have. Oh, I don't, I don't have any sound effect uh, soundboard uh, set ready, but uh, there we go. So hopefully that's Thank hopefully you. That Thank you for the entire crowd. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, okay. Uh, sorry, everyone, for those issues as well. Uh, yes, I have been keeping track. Uh, it's technically my job, uh, well, not, not a paid job, of course, just the conference. So I'm going to ask, being asking them. Uh, I believe there's one that you answered already, so I'm not going to ask that one again. Um, so with a very wide field of view of the All Sky camera, do you run into issues with aberrations closer to the horizon? Um, the short answer is yes. Um, the medium answer is fortunately I don't really care. Um, yes, there definitely were some issues. Um, Sutherland has a really nice view of the horizon, so you can see to about a degree or two degrees above the horizon without um, the mountains interfering. Um, but yes, I definitely did notice some things with that. And not just the horizon, but the edge of field of the camera. Um, it's probably a, a function of the fissile lens. Um, or maybe a, an asterism, as I think he suggested, or the uh, Oscar suggested. Um, but yes. Um, as the telescope isn't pointing near the horizon and you can't generally see things on the horizon and there's often buildings in the way um, or mountains in a couple of directions, it's, it's not a major issue. Um, and because this was a project with a lack of time available to work on, it's not one I, I tackled more thoroughly. Ah, thanks. Um, okay, and then the second question. Is the size of the circle related to Salt's field of view, or is it simply the direction? Um, by some coincidence, yes, it is. Um, so the field of view of Salt, no, sorry, I lie, I lie. The circle is the size of the full moon, and that is 30, 30 arc minutes on sky, so that's half a degree. Um, Salt's field, field of view is 10 arc minutes. Um, so the circle is three times larger than the field of view of the telescope itself. Um, the main restriction in the size of the circle is actually the quality of the original image. Um, it's, I think, 460 by 620 pixels. Um, so the decimation in the image is so large, there's no real point in trying to be ultra precise. And what you really want to do is see the star that the circle is over rather than obscure the star with the circle itself.
Okay. Um, thanks. Okay, now I'm not sure uh, if this was asked in jest or if the definition of the term is used literally, so quite broadly. Um, any yeah. UFOs? <laughs> That's a question at the observatory we get um, with some frequency. Um, we have on occasion, I haven't been able to find um, them for this presentation, sadly. Um, but yes, we have seen bright lights that we can't specifically attribute to anything. Um, you get used to what a meteorite or satellite or a plane looks like after a while. Um, in, in terms of alien spaceships, no, hate to disappoint you, sadly not. Um, but in terms of are there bright things in the sky that are hard to identify in a 60 second exposure, yes. Um, in many instances, they could just be space junk. Um, a tumbling rocket, um, a satellite re-entering Earth's atmosphere, um, but other than that, no, uh, we haven't seen anything that can be attributed to an extraterrestrial yet. Okay, thank you. Um, sounds like you answered this question a lot as well. Okay. Um, and then I have one question from myself. Um, has Starlink caused any issues for you? Ah, um, as yet, no. Um, I was trying to find, I think we did get a Starlink image on monitor of the Skycam ones. I didn't get a chance to take it up, sadly. Um, yeah, we haven't done a study into it. Um, we have seen satellites in our telescope images. It does happen from time to time. Um, but as yet, we don't know how much of an issue it is. I haven't seen uh, Starlink constellations frequently in those high cam images that I can say, but they tend to be a lot brighter than, say, the sixth magnitude stars you'd see. Sorry, a lot dimmer than the sixth magnitude stars you'd see in the images. Okay, uh, and then a new question. Uh, do you have an automated way of filtering images to remove external effects, for example, airplanes or video? Um, yes, such techniques exist. They're used in our um, science data. What's a bigger issue there is actually cosmic rays, because the science detectors are cooled down to, I think it's 130 Kelvin. Yeah, it's about minus 100 degrees. You see cosmic rays, um, so the same um, algorithms they use for removing the cosmic rays would work quite well for removing airplanes and meteors. Um, but is it necessary? No. What you would also do is end up removing um, stars um, and environment you're actually trying to get a better idea of. So you can do it, but in this use case, you probably wouldn't want to. Okay, uh, I got a, I think we're actually, uh, we, we allowed ourselves to run a bit over due to the technical uh, difficulties. Um, there's a possibility that the recording of this, uh, of this uh, talk might actually have better audio, but we'll have to see afterwards. Um, uh, okay, so again, uh, thank you for giving this uh, very nice talk, uh, Stephen, and thanks everyone for attending and asking questions. Thank you very much.